Hi, everyone. So, I'm happy to introduce you to one of my supervisors for my PhD. He is Dr. Georgius Filipos Palacios. About him, he studied physics with a focus on astronomy at the University of Athens. He then received his doctorate in astronomy at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn, Germany. Since then, he has continued working at the MPIFR, this, this institute, as research associate. His tasks include the coordination of correlation and calibration and calibration of DLBI data and scientific interpretation of the AGNs. He is also part as an active member of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. So this is a quick summary about him and Thank you. Yeah, so today I will talk about jet launching at multiple scales uh, with uh, DLBI. So yeah, so the outline of the talk today is um, I'll talk about the source that I focus on, which is 384, and why this is interesting. Um, and then we will look at the different regions of the jet, so the core region, the ultimate vicinity of the supermassive black hole, and how it agrees with the mass, the magnetic field and the downstream jet, and also look at the kinematics and offer an outlook and some conclusions. And here I show the VLBI arrays that we use. So the top, of course, is the EHD with the longest baselines and high frequencies. And we also have the GMBA with the lower frequencies but more telescopes. And again, the EBM, which is the European VLBI report, which has, uh, I think, even more telescopes and those lower frequencies, uh, we get a uh, very good UG coverage, which I'll talk about. So, um, Jet launching and collimation has still a number of unanswered fundamental questions that we try to investigate. For example, uh, we can use radio galaxies, uh, which are a prime test bed, to answer these questions about uh, where the jet base is and where the black hole is located exactly, what the core region is, and also look at the kinematics, see how the jet is launched. Uh, how it accretes, how it accelerates, and also if there's, for example, ballistic or non-ballistic motion in play. So, very briefly, our assumption is that we are looking at the jet, which uh, is launched by a black hole from its two poles. We have the matter accretion around it, and there's uh, two different scenarios of uh, what we might be looking at. The first one is called the blood one type of jet, in which we have the jet which is launched directly from the black hole. It's usually powerful and very uh, fast moving. On the other hand, the second scenario is a backward and paint type of jet, which is the middle part. And here we have usually a wider jet, which is launched from the entire operation disk. And uh, this is an effect that it's usually less powerful, but also slower. For a more realistic scenario, in my opinion, is to have a stratified combination of the two, in which we have this uh, fast spine in the center from the gazette type of launching. And surrounded, uh, surrounding it is a, a sheet, a jet sheet, which is uh, launched from, uh, from the accretion disk and is uh, slower. So, as I write here, we can distinguish these jet models by looking at the jet explicitly. And we do that by looking at the magnetic field and Here's how the configuration would be in these two scenarios. So, if it's directly launched from the atmosphere, like I said, the faster and more powerful jet, we expect the uh, magnetic field lines to have been uh, accreted and uh, be connected to the, to the vicinity of the black hole, whereas if we have the accretion disk uh, launching it, then the magnetic field is like wider and we have uh, the magnetic field lines connected there. And so, to the, the prime tool to do that is to use very long baseline interferometry. And here I just show quickly a slide of how this works. So we have a distant radio source in the, in the sky, which uh, sends out the radiation. And because it's in the far field, by, by the time they arrive to us, they're more like uh, plane waves. So they look like that. Then we have telescopes all around the globe. Yeah, just show a pair for simplicity. And the, the information, the signal arrives at two telescopes with different times. And that's how we get what is called this pattern, it's fringes in the sky. And from that, we can then determine 
uh, the source uh, construction by combining the signal from all the different resistors around the world. And so, as you know, um, the angular resolution depends on the wavelength of observation and also the size of the vision. And if we want to look at black holes, we have to go very low. We need the best possible angular resolution. There's two ways to do that. Either we increase the distance uh, between the telescopes. So with field of the eye, we can go into the space. For example, we, there used to be this uh, radio astron mission where besides the telescopes on the Earth, it was also a satellite on the radio, uh, a radio telescope on a satellite. And we got these very large distances up to 350,000 kilometers. And the alternative is to go to lower uh, wavelengths or higher frequencies. And that's what we and I did, and I will be talking in this work. So here I show again the GMBA, which stands for the Global Millimeter View of the I array. And you see where the antennas are located around the Earth. So, um, millimeter view of the eye, so higher frequency view of the eye, offers a number of advantages. We can peer through self absorbed regions, go to the control. We can explore the physics of the central engine and look at the origin of jets. We can also zoom into the very centers of radio galaxies, uh, achieving typical spatial scales of less than 0.1 parsec for a few thousand radio uh, structure radii. And at 3 millimeters with the VLBA, we get what is called the Euclid Hubble, which is basically the distance between the individual telescopes. And then using the rotation of the Earth, filling out this plane. And so this would correspond to a telescope the size of 9,000 kilometers. So that's basically what we can achieve with VLBI. And also get this high dynamic range. Now, of course, we can do synergy. We can do um, spectral studies by combining different frequencies, for example, 7 to 1 millimeters with the different arrays. And also do broadband multi wavelength campaigns using. X-rays, for example, here I show I mentioned IXB and Sandra or gamma rays with Fermi or all other telescopes. And so uh, the the, <laughs> the shot that we use for this analysis is called TC84 or NGC 1275. And it's uh, the central most bright galaxy in the Perseus cluster. Um, it's really interesting as a source because it exhibits uh, Low, uh, move, uh, low speeds of the jet uh, components. So we don't get a lot of Doppler boosting. And so even though it's very powerful, we can study the phenomena uh, in, in very good cadence. So we don't need to study, you know, like uh, every week or something because things move slowly. So even with the GMBA program, we would do just twice per year, we can still study the source. Also, it has a, large, uh, a rather large viewing angle so we don't also see things move like in the laser. And here I show two pictures at higher frequencies of the, the galaxy. So on the left is the optical, and this an HST image, and you can see the, the bright uh, core in the center, and also interestingly these filaments, which seem to em emanate from, from the core and also probably be supported by the magnetic field. And here on the right, is a, uh, a composite image of the source. So the columns are X-rays. You can see that there's an absence of X-rays, these two darker spots, which usually are referred to as X-ray bubbles. And they seem to correspond also to the radio mission. So these contours are VLA contours. And uh, so it seems that the jet is basically pushing away in the cluster medium, which is the one that creates the X-rays which light. And the second interesting thing, in my opinion, is that it seems to be misaligned. So the jet axis is more or less north to south, but if you look at this um, the bubbles, they seem to be misaligned with that, which might be due to some mutation or rotation happening. Yeah. So, is this the brightest cluster galaxy? Or... I think it's one of the brightest, it depends on the frequency. Uh, okay, but it's not the, the, the most massive one, like I mean, the one sitting on the top. I think it is. It's the brightest in the cluster. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I um, ask another question? Yes. What's the wavelength of the optical image? Is it a wavelength? It's a wave. Um, yeah. So if we now use the LBI, we can peer deeper into 
the core region. So this is again the HSP image. And uh, with VLBI, this is very uh, impressive double sided jet was revealed. So we have this central region, the two loops, not in the south. Did you see the, uh, the scale here is way lower, of course, than the optical? And also, there seems to be this connection, this elemental connection between the loops and the, and the core region, which is interesting. And then, if we go to space, we get this image, which is a radio astron image of the source of the satellite. And we can still see this uh, Salman jet, which is the approaching jet. And we can see two features. The one feature is um, this limb brightening, which is basically these two rails here that uh, um, are in the north south direction connecting to the central region. And more interesting, in my opinion, is this elongated core region, which naively we will think that it will basically follow the bar jet flow, which is in the north south direction. It seems to be perpendicularly oriented to that. And so we want to see uh, what is the cause of that. This is also visible in polarization. So again, I'm showing on the left a three millimeter image of the same source. You can see here that the polarized flux is reaching deep into the core region. We have to keep in mind though that the polarization in this source is very variable. So this is just one month apart of each other. So you see March to June. You can see how much the polar signal changes in the core. This is something intrinsic to the source. And so let's look at uh, the results of our analysis. First, we look at the compact region. And in VLBI, uh, the nature of this type of observations, that we lose the absolute pollution information. So we get an apparent phenomenon called core shift, which means that depending on the frequency that we observe, the core region, so this central right region, seems to shift in the sky. This is just an apparent. Uh, anomaly. And so the higher the frequency is, the, the, uh, the closer this core is uh, to the actual location of the black hole. And so we try to leverage that to actually find where the black hole is located. So we can assume that the, uh, the jet is homogeneous and quality flowing. And then if we just uh, use this uh, simple uh, parallel, we can find and extrapolate where the black hole will be located. So here on the left panel, we can see where this extrapolation leads us. So we used uh, three frequencies, 50, 40, 50, 60 gigahertz, and that's also the 56 gigahertz for two hours. And if we use that extrapolation, we see that the black hole is actually off-centered from what the peak in the contour is. So it's this red right dot here. But this is just one epoch, so we want to be to, to confirm that. So we use more epochs. This is six uh, epochs stuck, uh, stacked on um, top of each other in the center panel. And we tried to fit how the jet basically opens. So we tried fitting like a parabola and a cone. And N1 and 2 are the apexes of this bits. So N1 is for the parabola, and then 2 is for the cone. But with this analysis, we didn't get a conclusive result. So we went a step further, which is the right panel, and I'll try to walk you through it because it's a bit busy. So this is about Lawrence factor versus green. So the way we view the jet versus how quickly the components. And then we have um, these two different types of lines. The, the continuous lines is the jet to counter ratio, for which basically you draw a line here, you measure the flux north, south, and you get the ratio. And also we got the, the apparent uh, speed of the uh, jet components. And then since this uh, two types of lines cross each other, we get the same regions, which correspond to the two apexes. And then if we compare uh, this shaded regions with the with li literature values for the apparent speed and the, and the jet part of the ratio, we see that this falls around here, which seems to be more consistent with the uh, parabolic. <laughs> so um, a, a third option, which doesn't include VLBI, is to use light curves. 
So these are the life curves uh, of the source, this historical data from 2005, that um, sent, and centimeters and millimeters here. And it's again the same phenomenon, basically. So if you have a flare, uh, as you can see here, depending on the frequency, it will arrive sooner or later uh, here. And so based on the time lag uh, between when this uh, flares will arrive, we can extrapolate the distance, basically. And from the distance, we have here more data points since we have more, um, more light curves. We can again fit the same power law and get an estimate. And so overall, we find that the black hole is between 200 and 1500 Schwarzschild radii upstream of this 3 millimeter real VI core black hole. Um, a side product of this analysis is what's called the spectral index map, which in which the spectral index is we define it as the positive exponent of the frequency if we assume that it's proportional to the bits. And here's a cartoon of what we might expect to see in this core engine, this elongation that I was talking about. So, oops. Um, yeah, so if we have a uniform disk or a coordination chart, then we expect that there is no gradient. So we expect a lot of black spectral index. If the black hole is off centered, as we saw, we expect that there is a gradient. For example, if it's on the west side, and it's an east-west gradient, if it's north and it's south. And if the, if the jet is edge brightened and the black hole is somewhere in the center, then we expect a gradient which moves from the inner part to the outer. And so here's what we got from, again, the frequency that I talked about. We indeed find a robust detection of this north-south direction of the spectral index. And if we look in the core region, which is uh, I don't know, the highest resolution that we have for spectral index in this source, we see that uh, it is again north south, with spectral index values up to two, and the north part going down to minus 1.5 or less. But this is just one epoch. So we wanted to also check if this is persistent with different epochs. So we gathered all the data we could find for that. And uh, this is just 3, uh, 4 to 3 to 60 gigahertz, so only one map per epoch. And as you can see again, we find that this um, north south, uh, sorry, this gradient is uh, detected, but it's not always north south. So in the first epoch, it goes more or less north south, but then it seems to move more to the northwest southeast side. And this might be a consequence of this rotation that I was talking about in the beginning. So if, if the jet is rotating the core, then we might see different components boosting or de-boosting the, the flux. But uh, we will get to that also later. And as I said, this is all connected to the magnetic field. So we can estimate the magnetic field from this analysis. Again, we assume that the uh, uh, jet is conical homogeneous and secret from self absorbed. And then, uh, using this formula, which you don't need to focus on, the only important thing is that the two observables that we use is this omega, which is Porsche, and this alpha zero, which is the uh, optical instrumental index. Everything else is constants which we can use. And from that, we get that the magnetic field at the jet apex is two to four gauss. If we extrapolated it to less than 10 Schwarzschild radii, we can compare it to other well-known nearby um, radio galaxies like M7 and MC22. And then we find that there the magnetic field is 17, 70 to 600 Gauss, compares well to those sources. And the other thing we want to do is to compare it to the lack objects and quasars. So we basically extrapolated it for around one parsec. And there is 0 0.06 to 0.2 Gauss, which is 46 times lower than those sources which indicates possibly intrinsic differences between pc before and uh, such process. So, having looked at the core, we use the event horizon telescope to look even deeper into it, to get them to the vicinity of the supermassive black hole. And um, for this, um, we, we used uh, the the EHT UV coverage with the black points and also the VLBA and GMBA data points. So you can see that this is very sparse, except the black points for the EHT. 
but still we can do some science with that. We cannot do an image, but we can do the geometrical model. So, um, this is a result. And um, we have the lower frequencies here and the EHD model. So we find these three components, which also fit well to this uh, core elongation that we saw. Uh, we call them C for core, E and W for east and west. And uh, you can see that we can go to very low spatial scales for that, and how it looks like at uh, lower frequencies, where the elongation is also being still prominent. This is all started simultaneous. It's all from uh, the spring of uh, 2017. So, um, the, the question is if it's two or three models, because as you saw in the previous um, and slide, this W components could also be spurious, so we just wanted to, to be sure if it's there. And so what we did was look at those updates and try to do a fit with two or three Gaussian components. You can see that the fit with two, which is the dashed line, is not good, whereas with three, it's more prominent. So this points us towards uh, including this uh, third component, this W component, in our analysis. We can squeeze out even more information using polarized light. So this is the same map uh, of uh, 384, but in polarization. And as we expect, the core region, central part, is more uh, unpolarized, whereas the east and west components are more polarized. And uh, this is indicative of uh, being the foot points of the approaching jet, because we know for the source that there's a pretty short medium around it, which is hiding the counter jet, but we don't see it with the low scales. Um, and we can also get some information from the turnover frequency. Again, you don't need to focus on these equations, but uh, the gist of it is that we can find the magnetic field, which is 36 cows, and this is also in um, agreement with what we found in the analysis, which is <coughs> um, Using also the rotation measure, because we have these four frequencies, we can get an estimate for the spin of the black hole which is around one, so gravity rotating. We can get also an indication for the addition flow, which is a friction dominated. We can get the magnetization, which is uh, 40 to 90, which corresponds to a magnetic area like this. And so overall, this seems to be consistent with the plan for the side type of jet launching. So if you remember the fast spine launched by the average speed of the black hole, which is also consistent with the light curve analysis that we did, which is uh, not evolving any field yet. And so, having a look at the core and the specificity of the black hole, we also wanted to study the plasma scale jet because, as I showed you, this shows a very nice uh, plasma scale jet. And for that, we move from the EHT UV coverage, which is very sparse, to the European VLBI network uh, UV coverage, which is uh, almost like field, basically. Of course, at lower frequencies, but that's how we can study the project. And so, this is what the uh, large scale jet looks like. So, at uh, 22 gigahertz, what we use to jump the junction jet is resolved. You can see how it looks like here. And uh, we see this double rail structure that I showed you in the radio astron uh, data uh, eight years later. So, this is from 2021. So, this seems to be a persistent feature of the jet. And it's also perhaps a negative of the jet certification, which I will talk about in a minute. So to see if that uh, certification is there, what we did was to use historical data of the source from 10 years. So I think this is 2010 to 2021, I think. And we stack them with the three frequencies. That's how it looks like here. We also got the ridge line of the jet. And then we took transverse slices that to see how many Gaussians we basically need to fit it. And the best result without overfitting is using two Gaussians. And so this uh, is indicative of uh, this double rail that we saw. 
And uh, this two links, this rail that I'm talking about, we've interestingly found that it seems to persist in the core region, but in polarized light. So, so far we've seen a few times for the source that uh, this, uh, these two links are there in Stokes eye. But now we can see that it also reaches deep into the core in uh, linear polarization. <laughs> Uh, so we see this basically four regions, which I call R1 through R4. If we first look at uh, R3, R4, and R2, you can see that there seems to be this um, uh, this double limbs, like I said. And in the center, there's this spine, so this R2 part. And they are distinguishable by the EVPAs. So the EVPAs are the electric vector position angles, which I plotted with the white sticks, and they basically show the orientation of the electric field, which is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And we can see this distinction in the sheath part, where the magnetic field is in parallel to the voucher flow, whereas in the inner spine part, it seems to be perpendicular. And then there's also this R1 region, which um, shows an increase in the magnetic field. And I didn't include it here, but we know from other papers in the literature that uh, around this source there seems to be uh, an ambient medium, which might be colliding with the jet there, increasing dust polarization, and maybe it also move uh, downwards. So this might be some sort of shock. And we use simulations, these are RMHD simulations, to see uh, what the magnetic field corresponds to that. So this is the simulated image. We can see again this uh, two uh, limbs. And you can see that we more or less get this uh, EVPA uh, geometry that I talked about. So we again have the perpendicular ones in the sheath and they get more parallel in the spine. And this corresponds to a toroidal magnetic uh, uh, field. And on the other hand, the colloidal one, does not uh, reproduce that. And so this is a problem I feel is consistent with this fine sheet geometry that I was talking about. And so to make sure that it um, is not reproduced by the other configurations, we tried to vary the light Lorentz factor and the magnetic field configurations. As you can see, uh, for the different bulk Lorentz factors, it gets more elongated. So more boosted as we would expect, which does not correspond to what we see in other equations. Whereas for the different magnetic field geometries, we basically use the students that we were talking about. And so with this, I think we can claim that this is a relatively robust section of what the magnetic field is. And having a look at the whole jet, we also looked at the kinematics over many years. And so I, I included this slide because I find it interesting that for the source, people have been doing that for more than 20, almost 30 years. They were able to follow the components. We can connect these components that I will be talking about in our work with these components from the past. And so and we were able to cross identify the components at 40, 10, and 60 gigahertz. So these are the five components F1 through F5 that we were able to cross identify. Yes, so this is almost uh, 20 years. And uh, we draw some conclusions from those. We saw that uh, the overall moon is subluminal in the core region with up to 0.1 times the of light. Uh, newly ejected components, so everything right of this red line that I plot here, seem to move quicker, which is in agreement with. The, the idea that this is a restart right? because it, it wasn't as active before, I think, uh, the early 2000s, and then it uh, caught up. And you also see that the components at 86 gigahertz marginally seem to move faster. This is a two signal question. And uh, this might also be due to the fact that 86 gigahertz we can look deeper into the, the jet flow, whereas where, where the spine is. We fall to feel we can't look as deep for the sheet lips, which looks um, slower. And this is just a cartoon of what we might be looking at. So we have the components initially um, 
slow and uh, pointy fluctuation, and then we can start seeing them, they seem to speed up. Um, as I already mentioned in the beginning, we used the historical data of the light curves, which is more than 40 years of data work. And uh, we tried to see where the, when the components were ejected, if there was any activity happening in the light. So as uh, you already mentioned, uh, uh, these light curves correspond to the centimeter radial flux. This is millimeter at the bottom. The white ones are gamma rays, which are come to a bit. And so we have this uh, F1 and F2 components that I talked about, which unfortunately we do not have any millimeter flux here to see if we have any glass happening. And in the centimeter, it doesn't seem to be anything going on at the time of the ejection. So the shaded region is more or less when they were ejected, plus minus the so. But if we now look at uh, this um, W1, which is this thicker gray part, we, we, we can see that this corresponds to basically the maximum of the centimeter flux, at least that was ever observed for that source in the early 80s. And this corresponds to the first component that we were able to identify only in 86 years, because back then they, we had no positive negative observations. And if we back extrapolate this position and also use the position angle, we can identify with this um, diffuse region that we can see here, which people usually refer to as C2, but um, for consistency reasons, I just call it W1. And this, if it is true, then this would be the first um, um, explanation of what this uh, diffuse region is and where it came. Now, if we uh, focus on the last three components, so we have a lot of data, we can see that in the radio flux, uh, F3 and F4 seem to be on the onset of gas, whereas F5 seems to be on the, uh, the decrease of the flux. But interestingly, in the gamma rays, so the white ones, uh, this seems to kind of be anticorrelated. So it seems F3 and F4 might be on the decay, whereas F5 seems to be on the onset. So there seems to be some correlation, but we cannot tell for sure what came first and what came last. Uh, to try to answer that question, though, we did uh, cross uh, lack of cross correlation analysis in the, the millimeter flux and the gamma rays. And you can see these two peaks at, um, at uh, one millimeter to gamma rays, it's a five sigma detection, at 345, it's a bit below. But in any case, they're consistent with each other, these, these two peaks in both uh, frequencies. And so, since we have two, one's positive, one is negative, that might indicate that there's multiple ejection regions, basically. And yeah, I should say that for gamma rays, a positive timeline means that the gamma rays are trailing the radio flux, whereas the negative is that they were coming after. And one way of uh, interpreting that is for the downstream gamma rays, is that uh, we have perhaps turbulence happening there which causes this sort of mini jets, as they call them, which would then be responsible for the gamma rays being downstream of the, of the radio flux. So, of course, naively, we would expect, since they are more energetic, that they would be upstream, and then first uh, they arrive, and then the radio arrives. And another byproduct of our analysis was that we checked uh, the flux levels of when the components were ejected. And so we find this upward trend, which shows, I think it also is uh, intuitive, that uh, during times of uh, increased flux, the components which were ejected seem to be, they'll turn out to be moving faster than when the flux was uh, lower. And finally, we also see this overall variability this larger sinusoidal um, uh, behavior, let's say. And we try to make sense of that by looking at the position angle of the inner depth, which I've got with the line, and the different um, 
decades. So this is in the 80s, this is in the 90s, 2000, when we And we see that this um, sinus wave, or periodicity, uh, uh, let's say, seems to also be connected to the, to the swing of the jet, basically. And people have also tried to, to model that um, in the past. And uh, what they get is uh, a consistent uh, model with uh, a precession jet, I think with a period of around 12 years. Maybe. And um, we also, that's what I'm currently working on, uh, try to look at the filamentary structure of the jet. And um, this is the same data set that I was talking about. And we, we try to fit the, the filaments that we saw, which also saw this periodicity. And we will try to see if there is a connection between the light curve, the, uh, the simulations, and what we observe nowadays. And um, so, like I said, this could be connected to a precession happening or mutation, or maybe some instability like the power box or chain that occurred during instability. And so here's how, in my head, this makes sense. So what we have um, is a core with an inner filament being surrounded by a sheet. And this helical filament is rotating. And so depending on which side of it is basically pointing at us, we can explain everything that I think we saw. So we can explain the spectral index time variability. So in the core, when this part is looking at us, maybe it's in the east-west. <coughs> If this part is looking at us, it's really not so. We can um, make sense of the trajectories of the components that they maybe speed up when they, when they move downstream. The stratification, as we said, is the sheath surrounding it, with the filament being on the inside. Um, also, the increase of the, of the velocity during the during, um, Intense uh, flux periods could be explained by that again based on where you know, this is pointing in the spectrum, and also the minima and maxima and the variability as I, I plotted it here it increases the, the wavelength also so in the previous slide so this here is a bit smaller and increases so as we go down and um, finally I think the most interesting part of this work is that we. We can use it as a basis to verify what we have shown so far with our own HC data. So what I was talking about was some 2017 data where as you saw the unit coverage was very sparse. So there was not much else we could do besides geometrical monofitting. But we have some PI data coming up. Hopefully soon we have the first data set and the next one will be next year, which will observe in 2021, actually 2022 and 2023. And with this, hopefully, we'll be able to actually make the first images of the uh, 384 and with the EHT. And since we have also um, the lower frequency data being of work which were observed uh, simultaneously, we can try to discriminate between different models. So, what a black hole is, if it's a black hole in the object, if you see this, if it's a curve, depending on the direct imaging. On the spectral index imaging and three frequencies, and also the polarity. With that, I arrived at my conclusions. So, we demonstrated the capability of the WLBI to resolve jets transversely in nearby the galaxies. For this 84, we found that the core region exhibits subluminal motion with the of the bones of the cluster. The jet apex is 200 to 1500 spots of the upstream of the 3 millimeter WLBI core. The magnetic field is highly coherent and strong in that uh, core region around the supermassive black hole. Uh, that accretion flow is attraction dominated and uh, connected to inner magnetically arrested states or so mantis around the rapidly rotating black hole. Uh, the emission, the polarized emission in the traces is the limbs that we saw in the stroke sky. And um, from the simulations, we get that the uh, uh, EVP orientation, so basically how the magnetic field is oriented, uh, suggests that we have a toroidal magnetic field in that uh, area, which is consistent overall with the spine sheet geometry that we saw. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, 
and we have a lot of time for questions. We don't know anything about the subject, but so the filament is also part of the chain. Yes, so I'm thinking that this is the spine <laughs> that I was talking about. But if the jet is uh, rotating, then we would have this curves of show. So basically, it would be the spine, but not just straight, just rotating around. So, but both the, what you call the jet mm -hmm. or the sheet yeah. and the, on this mm -hmm. fine yeah. filament, all are particles. Yes, so it would be particles. Yes. Yeah. But now we're also looking if there's uh, Kelvin Hormones uh, stability, so maybe there is no rotation. So that's what I want to study. So I mean, just to follow up, it's 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 a blob that has been the jet is emitting material blobs, let's say, and it's just growing. They're just tracking as a function of time. Yes. And because the whole thing is precessing or spinning, so it is ejected at different angles mm -hmm. as a function of time, and then I guess that's why you see this yes, unique sort of structure. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so uh, on slide two, uh, you mentioned. Uh, oh, Earlier in the talk, you you introduced the mechanism for representing Dr. P, mm -hmm. and you said that it was also possible that accumulation of heat might uh, occur. But mm -hmm. on slide 22, you mentioned, uh, oh, maybe it wasn't 22. I'm sorry. Uh, I forgot. But when you um, you say there's a reference for one kind of mechanism uh, on top of the other, how do you get to that conclusion? How do you uh, survey? You mean the strategic combination? Mm -hmm. oh. No, on another slide uh, yeah. where you uh, mentioned that um, you observe uh, certain magnetic field configuration. I, I, I don't uh, know what this you mean is. Mean is what you mean the mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In this part? No, it, it had well, all the uh, parameters were sort of uh, on the bottom of the screen. I can't remember the number. Uh, on the portion, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. you said that uh, you saw a preference for I can't remember what was going to be uh, over the other. I wanted to know how do you establish that? Ah, well, it's um, so a rapidly rotating black hole with high magnetization. Is the one that is uh, from uh, is corresponding to a sample in my type of jet, but that's from simulations that GRMST. So it, it's we, we didn't compare to GRMST, we just use the conclusions that we get from those uh, simulations to compare to our um, numbers, and these are the more consistent ones. Do you know what the magnetization is from, from your? Observations, could you infer? So this is the um, other thing about this, this 40 to 90. I mean, oh, yeah, that does that, yeah. So, phi is what? That's the magnetization? Yes, that's the uh, parameter. I think it, if it's the way we define it, I think it's, if it's below 15, then it's the uh, same disk. If it's uh, above 50, it's a math, so that's why I say 90 plus 40 to 90. That's not the ratio of magnetic energy density to kinetic energy density. Uh, that phi, I don't know what, how it is defined. No, this is the, I, I think it's called magnetization, uh, where you can do this comparison about uh, the, uh, the same versus math models. Okay, I think it's it's but it, it's only the mad models that give you the precessing, correct? Yes. So that already establishes that has yes, to be an extra Okay. Um, so follow up, I guess the latest question would, would be you looked at the polarization yeah. and do you ex I guess you don't expect the same uh, you accept, expect the helical structure in the mm -hmm. spine, but not so much in the sheath. Yes. So were you able to distinguish the two given the polarization? No, with the polarization <laughs> with the simulation, we can see that uh, it is consistent with a toroidal or helical. What I'm, what I'm saying here. Because if you do the the toroidal, I'm sorry, you do not get this um, basically 
seems more like the single spark spark. But that's from the EVM. From the EHT, we cannot do that yet, but hopefully we can get that. Yeah. Any questions on Zoom? I'll come back. I'll come back to you. Any questions on Zoom, Sundar? No, we do not have any questions on Zoom. Uh, you showed the uh, slide 15, I think, uh, cartoon with some disks, videos. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what is the relation? That one, yes. So this year. Yes. Look, what is the relation with the jet base? So this is the cartoon of the jet base, basically. Ah, base. And just depending on where the black hole is and how how the intensity is distributed at the two different frequencies where you do the spectral index map, you get two sort of different gradients. So if uh, if there's nothing there, there is no gradient. And then we would expect that uh, it's either a disk or a shock, but depending on if um, uh, the black hole is off center or not, uh, we can get to uh, the next gradient, and then this just tells us basically where we would expect the black hole. Uh, but the overall, this is just the jet phase. So, this elongation now we're talking about, I made an ellipse out of it, okay, it would be a bit more realistic, I guess, but uh, that's basically the Uh, since because you have several frequency uh, with GNPA, uh, were you able to do also some motion measure study? Yes, so I didn't uh, include it here, but basically, the, the results of I was talking about here, where things this, I guess, in this formula, you, you need the rotation, so we use that. To calculate all these um, parameters that I listed. And do you have also information about the sign of the rotation measure given your insight on, on the direction of the two filaments in the base of the jets? Um, no, the data will not be Okay. But hopefully, like, we have the same basically frequencies for the 2021 data. So 15, 40, 36, um, 230. Thank you. Time for more questions. Okay. All right, so you mentioned something about this yes, with specification. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so did you verify this to be due to imaging effects or something like that? What sorry, what effect? Due to imaging. Ah, effect. like it's an artifact. Yeah. Um I would say no because it um is detected through three least ten years by different people at different frequencies or different modalities. Um, and we have, like I said, because it's very close and very bright, we have very high SNR dynamics. So, um, so you change the imaging parameters and specification say that you take something like that? Yeah, of course, we can. We, we've tried different weighting as well, uniform data tabling. You always need through different, uh, through the years, you always need at least two versions. Always. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking of how the PSF will look like with so, such a quartz. Mm -hmm. so, okay, thank you. Just give me. This source is very bright in the yeah. radio, and, and you would expect, like, you know, Doppler boosting and superluminal motion, mm -hmm. but you don't see. No. Know, so, is, that, is this okay? I mean, it, it is very bright. Yes, that's why it's one of the. I think the sources of studies are jets because I think the most that people have seen very downstream is up to 0.9, but now in the core region, because I'm only talking about the center of 0.5 parsec. There it's only 0.1 to 0.2 C. It uh, speeds up downstream. So in the parsec scale region around 3 to 5, it gets up to 0.5, but uh, we only look at the core region. So there it's fine. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Regarding this, uh, the velocities, uh, uh, the velocity you mentioned and the fact that the jet speed up to up in, uh, after, I don't, I don't remember the, the, uh, when it speed up. Like three plus. Okay. This is beta band or? Apparently, yes. Okay, so this is 
the justification of this is the 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 angle that's to, how I to work the observing mm -hmm. okay. It seems like everything is consistent with black engineering. Uh, so, are you arguing that we've actually proven uh, uh, the, the theoretical model, or is there anything that you couldn't explain? Well, I wouldn't go so far to say I proved it, but I, if we can see the same in the same data next to epochs, so we can actually do images, and I think it would be very, very um, Strong argument towards it. I think also most jets, based on the theoreticians, are consistent with black words and I don't know what happened in mind, but they didn't do it. Um, something that's not um, explained. I think it's a bit curious that the, um, the magnetic field is a thing rather low, like, for example, I don't know the energy level, it's higher. But that also might be connected to the slow uh, speeds that we see. But I think that would also be a good thing. Because the thing is, with simple concept of torsion, torsion and rotation, as we always get this slow moment. So it is consistent between the analysis, but I just wonder why it's on the okay, One last question. Um, do you have any uh, idea if the um, spin of the black hole is? Uh, Aligned the yeah. uh, directional spin of the uh, accretion disk. Is that why we are? Uh, we don't have any information. What kind of uh, improvements in uh, the uh, equipment and sending for distance would you need to be able to assess that? I mean, we can get the resolution to image the black hole, which would mean that we need satellites in space again. Yes. And also perhaps more telescopes sometimes to increase the sensitivity. And we could make a statement about that. But with the perfect module. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. This is the name of the natural launa treinta, brisa trapo. And next is a point that I'm not talking about. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>